Mm-hmm. What are you doing? What? Oh, I'm just warming up, Jamie. Mm-hmm. I've got something rather special to deliver after the uh, opening music. When you say special. Yeah, well, it's a little something that someone sent to us. And uh, <clears throat> I need to give of my best, you know. <clears throat> right. Ready when you are. Uh, right. Well, I'm looking forward to my special gift for our Ruby edition. Yes, it is. Of the Jerry Anderson edition. podcast. <laughs> of 40. Let's go. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Hi-ho and a jolly welcome to all of you surf-wide and interweb elopers here on the Podlycast. Behold the many-fold things Jerry and most. All deep joy and thank us for great laugh and tittery. Oh, yes. Wow. How's that? Well. That's all right. I'm not sure what's happened. Well, now, you, you of course, will remember in our last podcast, we did ask for people to send in a little (laughs) bit of unwinnies. Did we not? I didn't think anybody would, though, Richard. No, I didn't think anyone would either. But, um... But we have had a little something, and there it was. Yeah. Delivered in my best Professor Stanley Unwin. Oh, I think you did a marvellous job. Really. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm impressed okay. and slightly frightened. They don't call me a one-take wonder for nothing, you see. <laughs> oh, I just did it the once, didn't I? You did. Eh? Yep, genuine no editing required. That's so, right. Um, so uh, thank you very much to... Um, Simpsons Clip 24. For sending that in. Who uh, recently joined us for a Fab Live. And I hope yes. you joined us for Fab Live last week as well. Yes, that's right. If you missed it, then you should go and have a look at it on the Jerry Anderson YouTube channel. Yes. So here we are. This is the Jerry Anderson Podcast, as I'm sure you must be aware if you're listening. Well, I hope they are. Yeah. Uh, who are you again? Jamie Anderson. Oh, and yes. you? Uh, well, I'm Richard James. Good. And uh, we're here for the next, uh, oof, I don't know, 40 minutes or so, hour and a half. It depends, really. How long's a piece of string? Well, about 90 minutes long. It's twice mm. as long as half its length, Jamie. It is, yes, I know. But in this case, it's a podcast and it's about 90 minutes <laughs> on average. Uh, yeah, we've got all the usual stuff. Uh, we've got listener emails coming up a little bit later. We've got some uh, newsy news, news, news. Uh, we've got Chris Dale's amazing randomizer. Yeah. And uh, also, don't forget, I don't think there's anything I've forgotten. No. So don't forget, you can you, get it. You hmm? purposely missing out Fab Facts there? Did I miss out Fab Facts? Hashtag Fab Facts, one of the listeners' favourites, I think you'll find. Oh. Okay. Well, yeah. I randomly flip through a selection of facts, only for you to pick a fact and me to maybe pick the one you've chosen, but maybe not, and then yeah. we talk about it a bit. Yeah, and that's, that's it. it. Yeah, we'll that's that. literally it. Yeah, but that's it, people's favourite segment. You know, simplest is sometimes best, Richard. Okay. So. <laughs> Don't forget, you can get in touch with us at uh, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk, and of course, you can hashtag us on Twitter, and we'll see your tweets there. So you can either tweet I'm Jamie Anderson or Richard M. James, and hashtag us Jerry Anderson Podcast, and we'll pick up your messages. Yes, and we might read them out or well, answer them or do whatever we can. Yeah, for example, uh, Melvin Pena got in touch on Twitter this week saying, uh, my favourite parts of the Jerry Anderson podcast. Number one, Richard James singing, that was the news. <laughs> Number two, the twinkly music for Fab Facts. Yeah. Number three, the now weekly sing-along at the end of Fab Facts. And finally, number four, when Chris Dale gets a story he hates in the randomizer. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. So basically nothing where we actually say any words. No, and I don't think he mentioned you at all. No, actually, that's interesting. Or they did say Fab Facts. Yeah, and but without the me, music There would be no Fab Facts. So. <laughs> yeah. so yes, do get in touch with us. And of course, there is one more thing that I've forgotten to mention, which is our interview. Oh, yes. Because this week I've actually recorded the interview before we record the podcast, which didn't happen last no, time. well done you. So no rep- repeated weird no. Uh, insert. No. No, our interview this time is yeah. with Dirk Mags. Ah, Dirk Mags. Yes. Audio director, producer, writer, yes. all-round nice chap, uh, musician. Right. He's in that band, isn't he? What's the band called? Oh, I don't know. Is he in a band? Yeah. In fact, we don't talk about it in this part of the interview because there will be two parts, although they might be spread out slightly due to Dirk's availability. Okay. So we chatted for an hour and yeah. went, went over the allotted time. Is the band so, Dirk Mags and the something? No, or? no. It, um, no, this is embarrassing, but I can't remember what it's <gasps> called. But I'll, we'll, we'll put it in. In fact, Dorks. Dirk's band is called... The Riotous Brothers. Oh, I there, see what see? you did there. Yeah, very yeah, yeah, yeah. good, very good. So do look them up yeah. uh, and look forward to that interview with them later. Dirk's great and it's um, it's interesting because we talk more about the sound than usual. Normally uh-huh. people talk about the toys and the visuals and the explosions of the vehicles and the characters. 
but this one's all about the sound because mm. um, Dirk is very uh, orally orientated. Is he? Orally orientated. Mm. I never know how he differentiates. What, he likes owls, two. you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Chris Packham was quite owlery uh, orientated, didn't he? <laughs> Chris Packham, of course, a previous interviewee. You can check back on all our previous podcasts to hear interviews with the likes of Sophie Aldred, Chris Packham, Gary Newman, and um, also people like Wayne Forrester, Robbie Stevens, Nicholas Briggs, David, uh, Quantic. David Graham. Uh, uh, Shane Rimmer. Yes. Did you already say him? Yeah, they're all in McKinnon there. McKinnon and Saunders. Yeah. Gary Newman, you already probably said that. That's right. Did you see that Gary Newman tweeted our picture of him as Captain Scarlet? Indeed, I did. Oh, have I stolen your tweet from No, later? that's all right. No, I'll read it out later. It's fine. Okay. But yes, he I celebrated his birthday this week, didn't he? He and, did. Uh, yeah, Happy right. birthday, Gary. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> so, Richard, should we get underway without further ado? Oh. I've got my book. Well, I was going to go and grab a coffee, yes, actually. No, you've already had a coffee. All right. Here's the book. Mm. <laughs> well, it's certainly a book, yes. Well done. But is this is the first. Is the first time you've been in the presence of a book. Is it? Yeah, because we're recording this in the same room for the first time in a while. So. Okay. Anyway. Great. Right, Richard. So yeah. you know the rules. Mm. Uh, let's bring on the band. All right. Ah, yeah, careful, guys. Mind the... Uh, oh, someone's just spilled coffee. Cut, mop that up. Sure right, carry coffee. on. No. Um, so I flick through a book of fab facts. You shout fab. Mm. I stop on a page. Mm. We pick out a fact and we discuss it. You know, debunk it. Are surprised by it. Whatever else. Yeah. Great. And everybody loves it. And that's it. Hashtag fab facts. <laughs> yes, that's it, Richard. Right, are you ready? <laughs> yes. Right, try to avoid the picture pages because they're a bit rubbish. Ready? Yes! Fab! Ah! Now. Yeah. Now then. Let's see what we can find. Well, okay, this is... this. Uh, I mean, a lot of these are well known. This is a good one to discuss, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, okay, I don't, I don't know, I haven't heard it yet. Well, I'm going to tell you it is. So, Thunderbird 5 Space Monitor John Tracy mm. rarely appeared in the storylines for one reason. Uh. Jerry Anderson didn't like the character. What? As far as he was concerned, once John had taken the emergency call, that was that, and he remained banished to the space station. Crikey! Yeah. Funny that, isn't it? So, uh, it's interesting. Any other characters that you're aware of that Jerry wasn't particularly keen of in the... No, jo yeah. John was about the only one who, who was he, he hated, and I, I think it was... A lot of it was that he didn't think the sculpt was sufficiently heroic. Ah, uh, the actual face. It was, so it wasn't necessarily the character because they wrote the character. Yes, exactly. But I think, and I might be wrong here, but I think originally the John Tracy puppet was going to be Scott, but it was deemed to be not heroic looking enough. And so, so they was, shoved him up. They shoved him up, yeah. you know, up there in yeah. space. Uh, and so then Scott Tracy was the re-sculptor one to look like Sean Connery. Um, ah. and, and John was banished. Um, but I think, yeah, no, Dad didn't like the, the, character, it's, the character's look. Um, I don't think he was a fan of the voice, and so yeah, John just got shoved up there and barely Gosh, came down. Just on a whim like that. Yeah. The power Thank of you. a producer, right? Eh? I know, that's amazing, isn't it? I didn't know that. That is indeed a fab fact, <laughs> Jerry. Well done. <laughs> that's very charitable of you, Richard. If there are any characters in the Jerry Anderson universe that you've taken a disliking to, you do let us know, won't you? <laughs> at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm going to wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> I don't want to, flurry yeah, of I don't want to know. Emails I in. don't want to know. No, yeah. I'm sure everybody loved Dorian. Yeah. Anyway, there you go. So Very that's good. the end of this week's Fab, Fab Facts. <laughs> Great. Very good. Ian Jacqueline, who we know and love, and posts endlessly on Twitter about the all things. vociferous Twitter. Yeah, isn't he just? Uh, got in touch last week following the interview with um, the Forces TV. Um, Chap Adam Hardwick. Indeed. Yes. Uh, he says, thanks for showing, this was a, a tweet to, to Forces TV, thanks for showing the classic Jerry Anderson shows UFO and Space 1999. I do hope you will add other Jerry Anderson shows to your future programming. There is a hunger for these classic shows out there. Well, you discussed there that, is. didn't you? We did discuss and, uh, it. And it, right now it's not looking that rosy, but yeah. they have discussed it and they yeah. agree that Captain Scarlet would be a great addition to the roster. So yeah, let's see. because they've got a certain audience, haven't they, obviously, that they need to... Uh, they do, but, but, you know, I think they've, they, as others, have a... Uh, a preconception that those puppet shows are only for kids and they're really not they're always designed to be for families yeah. and stuff and they're because there's such a strong nostalgia factor I think that yeah. something like Captain Scarlet would go down really really well yeah. a bit That's of a break right. from the norms so we'll yeah. keep at them yeah. Ian also asks um, is the following story in your book of fab facts now this is a story I think we've alluded to in the past I'll read it out to you he actually posted or someone else posted the story in 1979 an 11 year old girl named Marianne Fleckery 
found some hollow container cylinders from a Space 1999 Eagle transporter toy in the garden of her home in Langley Crescent St Albans in Hertfordshire. Each of the cylinders had adhesive stickers featuring the radiation warning symbol and the words danger waste material printed on them. She persuaded firemen to visit in anti-contamination suits and take the cylinders to the then government radiation centre in Amersham. After the incident, Meccano, Dinky's parent company, promised to remove the radiation symbol and words. How's that? I have heard that story before. Yeah. Um, I don't know how true it is. Well. But let's just say it's totally true. <laughs> exactly. And what a great story it is. It is a brilliant story, isn't it? That's yeah. very nice. So uh, thanks for linking to that, Ian. That's fantastic. He also says... Um, another great Jerry Anderson podcast today from uh, Jamie and Richard. Thanks again for the mention. I would be up for a Jerry Anderson 50th podcast meetup. Best wishes to you both and all of your podcast listeners. Well, it's something we're thinking about. We thought about a meetup, tweet yeah, up yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're 10 weeks away now, so we've still got plenty of time. So, yeah. Well, yeah. Jamie's looking at me and I'm looking at Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> well, where, well are we, where are we going to host it? I know. How are we going to manage it? I mean, I mean, yes. Where can we record? I mean, I'm sure we can find a way. Uh, yes. I mean, who's going to be able to join us? Will it be during the day? Will it be in the evening? Yeah. I mean, did, did you see that Craig Johnson offered to host us? Did he? Yeah. Just, just All you around and me. All around to Craig's then. then. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's very kind, Craig. Well, why not? So. Yeah. Depends where he is, of course. I can't remember what he did say. Anyway, mm. yes. Uh, if you fancy a tweet up, then um, yeah, yeah. Or if you've got a you know a, a function room available somewhere that we uh, we could take over for the evening, somewhere fairly centrally based, I suppose. I don't know. It's always the King's Arms. I was going to say that would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, also, Richard, I was thinking. Oh, well, I wonder why you look pale. <laughs> I'm exhausted. This is slightly off topic. Um, you know how um, certain groups of fans of certain things have a name for themselves. Yeah. I just wonder what people who listen to the Jerry Anson podcast would like to be called. Right. I don't know, because you I mean, you could do something generic, like we had podcasts the other week. We did. On, but it's not really... Not J- a Jerry Anderson related, is no. it? No. Hmm. And if you, if you, I did think uh, uh, Gappers is a yes. Jerry Anderson podcast. Yeah. Hers. yeah. Although if you, you have to put in a second P there, otherwise yeah. it's Gapers. That's it's a bit weird. The Gapers. No, no one wants yeah. to call it Gaper. Exactly. Uh, mm. No, that's interesting. So if you have any ideas about what, you, what you'd like to be called, <laughs> let us know. Clean emails only, please. Yeah, that's right. Podcast.jerryanderson.co.uk. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, of course, uh, please don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to, whether that be iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or various other places. Podbean. Yeah, Pod Bay. Pod. Yeah, Pod. Pod. Yeah. Pod. The yeah. podcasting and fish and chips app. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, do leave us a review and a rating and uh, share us with your friends as well so they can join in the fun. Yes. I said that very quickly, didn't I? You did, but it's good. good. And they can join in fun like this upcoming section, which is the Jerry Anderson News. Fantastic. Are you going to say it? What? The newsy thing that you say? I might do. What, you want me to say it now? No, it's fine, don't worry. Uh, newsy news, news, news. <laughs> Newsy, newsy, news, 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 so, newsy, news, news, news. There are three new. Go on, Thunderbirds. Newsy news. T-shirts. News. Richard. Yeah. <laughs> there are three new Thunderbirds T-shirts live on the Jerry Anderson store, oh, as promised last week. Lovely. And they're really lovely. Mm-hmm. There's a Frank Bellamy comic panel of Thunderbird One and Thunderbird Two. Cool. A Lady Penelope comic uh, panel. Yes. And a third one, which is uh, five, four, three, two, one featuring sunken images of the Tracy brothers with their respective sash colours. It's very cool, Ooh, but you'll have to see. Wow. So there you go. Uh, have a look on the Jerry Anderson store for that. Ooh, um, yes. Also, Richard, mm. I'll insert the sound of a um, cup of tea, mug of tea being poured here from yeah. the pot. Let's hear it. Oh, Ooh. lovely. One mm. level two. None. Oh, no, no, controversial. No, no, for me, thank you. All right. Uh, but we've got these lovely heat-changing mugs in. Yes. They're rather nice, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're lovely. swanky. They are, they're great. Um, and some other t- nice tapered uh, Thunderbird 1 and Thunderbird 2 mugs uh, that have come in from Half Moon Bay. They're rather lovely. Mm. Flying out the door. Everyone loves them. Yeah. And this week, mm. Joe Nighty fans... Oh, right, talking to you, Joe Nighty yeah, fans. Yeah, obviously, yeah. You, no, there's lots of Joe Nighty <laughs> yes, fans. Right, I know. Um, the special edition Blu-ray box set from Network is out this week. Cool. Um, subject to any last minute changes in the schedule, mm-hmm. should be out on the 18th. Lovely. So um, enjoy that. 
uh, it's amazing. It's got a comic and mm. uh, the, the, it's got a lovely box mm -hmm. and uh, the, the Blu-ray itself with loads of extra features. Some produced by Anderson Entertainment. Highly recommended. Nice. So, yeah. Have Fun. A look at that. Great. And finally, yeah, oh yeah. Have you been on our YouTube channel recently, Richard? Uh, well, funny you should say that, Jamie. Uh, no. <laughs> You're very busy, aren't very you? Very busy man. You haven't got time. <laughs> some of you may have been, and if you haven't, then you're missing Century 21 Tech Talk. Now, I have seen this. I oh, have seen it. Yeah, actually. this is great. Yeah, so hosted by Brains, mm -hmm. voiced by the original Brains, David Graham, yep. at 93, yep. turning 94 this year, Century 21 Tech Talk explores the vehicles of the 21st century, uh, from Thunderbirds vehicles and Fab One through to let's just say a few others from around the Century 21 universe. Uh, we're releasing one episode a week um, and you can find it at youtube.com slash TV. and right now Thunderbird 1 and Thunderbird 2's episodes are out so go and watch them. Yeah, great. They're good, aren't they? Oh, they're really good fun. Yeah, very nice. And well done for getting David Graham on board. Well, he, he did work very hard, bless him. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's, it's not just brains that he voices. No, great. We'll just say that. Good. Me. Excellent. Oh. Hello. Excuse that noise. And uh, that is the that was the news that was the news well i was going for that was the end of the jerry anderson news but uh, well you could say that as well that was the end of the jerry anderson... <laughs> no, i can't say it no, you can't. You've got... that Probably was not. the end of the jerry anderson news it's because i turned the page of the script and i saw the words i made a boo-boo so... yes listeners there is a script <laughs> there it is there's the script anyway that mm. was the news yeah it was so thanks for playing along richard and for interrupting it constantly with newsy newsy news, news what it's just what the listeners expect Robert Monk got in touch on Twitter. People can reach us there by uh, hashtagging us Jerry Anderson Podcast or uh, tweeting I'm Jamie Anderson or Richard N. James. So he said, OK, I'm coming clean and hanging my head in shame. I've only just finished Pod 35. I'm four weeks behind. I have no excuse as to why. Please forgive me. Do we forgive him? All right, then. You see, I'm quite jealous. If he's only on Pod 35, that means he's still got four pods to go before he catches up. Yeah. Five, including this one. Exactly. Lucky man. What if he won't make it? it well. He might get bored. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Lawrence uh, said he's catching up with this week's Jerry Anderson podcast on the drive to work today. He enjoyed the Pat Sharp interview, but now he wants a funhouse racing car all over again. Oh. Yeah. A lovely bit of nostalgia there, you see? Yeah, that's right. So, it's weird that we're having nostalgic interviews about Jerry Anderson things, but people are getting, nost getting nostalgic about the things that the interviewees did as well. Yes, I know. That is a bit weird, isn't it? It matter. It is rather, isn't it? It's nostalgia. Yeah, yeah. so uh, do get in touch with us. And also, of course, you can email us. We love to hear your audio files, your voice messages, uh, and, of course, anything you want to uh, tell us, comment on, think about. Send it all into podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and we'll do our best to read it out. Please do, like all of these people did. Aha! Now it's time for listener emails. Yep, certainly is. Uh, now, Richard, that bit I read in the script earlier on... Oh, yeah. ...it says, I made a boo-boo. Yeah, I see that. Now, I did yeah. make a boo-boo. What did you do, Jamie? Well, do you remember last week when we opened and closed and discussed during the show, actually, the geographical spread of our listeners? Yeah. Well, I neglected to mention our listeners in one particular country. Mm. So the Isle of Man. Received... <laughs> No. Not there, actually. Oh. I don't get a breakdown by, uh, no. by um, aisles of... the Mans. Of great like, of men. No. Uh, no, not that one. <clears throat> but it, it, it started rather formally, which got me slightly worried that it felt like a bit of a legal letter. <laughs> to whom it may concern. Yes. Riding the train out of downtown Tokyo... Oh. You might know where it was now. Mm -hmm. I listened to Pod 39. And I didn't hear Japan <gasps> mentioned among countries where people are listening to this podcast. Ooh. Am I the only subscriber who's resident in Japan? Now, is this Michael House? It is Michael yeah. House, yes. He says, am I the only subscriber who's resident in Japan? If so, I can't help much with the promotion because I maintain a deliberately low profile online. <laughs> Sorry, but there is at least one regular listener here. Keep up the good work. Ooh. Be seeing you, yep. Michael House from Tokyo. Right. Now, Michael, you're quite right. I did miss Japan, which seems a bit silly in the context of the Jerry Anderson universe. Yeah. But we do currently have 86 listeners in Japan. Ah, oh, perhaps they were on the train with you, Michael. Yes, you, maybe you were surrounded yeah. by, by Jerry Anderson fans. That's right. the podcast. Yeah, try to make sure. at the same time. Exactly. Like hilarious jokes <laughs> and stuff. That's right. I also like the way he said, I maintain a deliberately low online profile. He said, emailing the Jerry Anderson podcast. Yeah. To tell everyone where he lives. Well, we haven't got his e email address no. No, in this. No. No. But, but his email address is. Uh, <laughs> hey, no, Jamie! No, no, no. no, no. Careful now. Anyway, Michael, sorry for missing you out, Japan. It, it was just a, you know, one of those things. Yeah. 
Um, but I can see how you'd be t- terribly offended that I mentioned Iceland, Iceland. Iceland. It was, well, B-Jam, as it used to be known, of course. <laughs> uh, and also, do I detect a, 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 a prisoner fan there be seeing you I in his possibly. little sign-off? Yeah, it'd be a bit odd. Or maybe you, all yeah. things cult, shall we say? Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, Michael, thank you. Sorry I missed you, Japan. And to the other 85 listeners in Japan... Mm-hmm. Konnichiwa. Yeah, konnichiwa to all of you. Thank Very you good, listening. there we are. Yeah, lovely. Uh, we've also received another telling off, Jamie. Oh, uh, not another one. So, yeah, I know. This is a, 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 from the uh, Couch Pilots who we mentioned in the last podcast who oh, were yes. reviewing Space Police. Oh, yeah, the failed Jerry mm, Ascoli. Which uh, made us raise our eyebrows a little and yeah. clutch our handbags to our chests. Um, <laughs> we got this email saying, uh, gents. Again, starts off rather formally. Yeah. Uh, I heard our humble little programme was mentioned on your superior podcast. Well... He's obviously plainly never listened. Flattery will get you everywhere, but yes, <laughs> you're revealing yourself. Indeed. Uh, attached, you will find our response to your query. Oof. Mm. Uh, also, let it be known that the episode of Couch Pilots where we mentioned Space Police is not typical. For whatever reasons, we thought we'd do a completely clean show, tongue-in-cheek, as our pod is usually a hard R rating. Mm. Thanks for entertaining my rambling. Oh. Let's listen to that, shall we? Okay. Hello, both of my friends. This is Jason from the Couch Pilots Podcast, reaching over to you from across the pond. A little birdie told me that our humble program was mentioned on your March 4th episode concerning Jerry Anderson's 1987 failed television pilot Space Police. Now, I emphasize the word failed because it's my understanding that the Space Police was made in 1987, was not purchased, and never broadcasted. And then it wasn't until 1994 that Space Precinct was picked up and in the process radically altered. Such a lapse in time, multiple changes, and even the name change itself puts this show directly in the Couch Pilot's crosshair as failed. Now, I don't mean this as a slight in any way, and please forgive me if I have any misinformation. I look forward to your response. Take care, and keep up the great work. Well... There we are. Well, I think we can still beg to differ, can't we? <laughs> we can. Because, you know... Yeah. Well, this this shows uh, the difference between kind of a, a US attitude towards TV pilots through networks, mm-hmm. where the networks does the kind of pilot season and commissions first episodes and broadcasts them and sees what the response uh, is. Ah, yes. Versus what we, we do as independent production companies, which is to produce a, a pilot which is a proof of concept. Uh-huh. So it's never really destined for broadcast as such. Yeah. These these are things to go out to broadcasters and distributors and say, here's what we want to do, here's uh-huh. a full demonstration of it, what do you think? I see. So Okay. If it was never aimed for broadcast, yeah. I would still take issue with your definition, yeah. Jason and the other couch pilot. Yeah. Fair enough pilots. though. Fair enough. So a little question of semantics there. Yeah, you possibly. say tomato, I say tomato. Exactly. Let's call the whole thing off and never mention it again. <laughs> anyway, there you go. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, for thanks for getting in touch. In. Yep. Um, I've got one from Ralph Burns. Oh, good. Which I don't think is a telling off. Right, well, that's a relief. Uh, might be. Mm. Hello, team. Oh, well, that's you and me then, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I'm Chris, I suppose, <laughs> and everybody suppose. else. Of course, yes. Hello, team, and many thanks for your fun podcast. Right. I think is this went, to the couch pilot? Yeah, he sent to the wrong people. Uh, I always like how cheery and positive it is, and I've been listening since pod one. Well, well done you. Um, it was the Thunderbird stream on Twitch that got me back into the world of Anderson. That's brilliant news. Oh, yeah. And I have since been enjoying New Captain Scarlet on Amazon Prime. Oh, lovely. Yeah. New Captain Scarlet available worldwide on Amazon Prime. Great. Uh, I only saw some of it back in the day due to how it was scheduled. Oh, we know what the rubber scheduling, don't mm-hmm. we, Richard? Mm-hmm. Um, great show, and it looks and feels like it was made yesterday, which is amazing for a 14-year-old CG show because CG ages so quickly. Yeah, but he's right. Ralph continues, now... I have a question. Uh Mm. Uh-oh. Oh, dear. The mysterious GFI pilot... Oh, yes. Speaking of failed pilots... (laughs) ...has been mentioned a few times, Mm. and it has piqued my curiosity. (laughs) I bet. I can well understand that it may not be of good enough quality to put out there into the world, but I would be intrigued to learn more. Mm. There's nothing like the unknown to get the imagination going. Perhaps the lovely Chris Dale could be tempted to do an article on it. Yeah, he's got time. Yeah, he has. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks for taking the time to read this, and have a nice day. Best wishes, Ralph. Ah, oh, thanks, Ralph. So, fill us in, Jamie. What's this about, then, oh, for those that don't know? The GFI pilot, mm-hmm. G-Force Intergalactic, uh, was made in the early 90s, and, um, yeah. Go on. It was weird. Uh, it was kind of... Thunderbirds meets Space Police meets other stuff. Right. Had a bit of a green ecological twist to it, so it was a bit of a head of its time in that way. Hmm. Um, it was essentially a, an intergalactic rescue crew 
who lived in a cottage under a dome on an asteroid and were then called out to people in distress. O often those distressed things were environmental disasters. Right. So it was all going okay, and then they decided they were going to make it in Russia because it would be cheaper. Uh, right. And the animation quality was pretty ropey, and it all started to unravel, really. The Ouch. first episode was delivered, and it looked pretty terrible. Um, and it was just so bit part, you know, the voice recording was done in, I think, Gloucestershire. Yeah. And the animation was done in Russia, and the music, I don't know where, where the music was done, yeah. but it was very kind of um, 90s synth Thinky kind donkey. of well you, do you know the sound of an orchestra hit oh yes i do yeah classic yeah, lots of orchestra oh hits. nice but in the 90s it's too late for for orchestra hit i would say yeah, a mini moog or something that uh well it was on roland roland's and everything uh, by then yeah. i think it was across right, yeah. anyway it's just not very good mm, uh -oh. um <clears throat> and it was bad enough us putting out the lost worlds of jerry anderson because <laughs> uh, but there were some elements of quality there where i, was, I just think unfortunately gfi was lacking but this was Any a full project. series, was it? No, it no, was, one episode only. But it was going to be a full series. It was going and to, what, uh, the, the yeah. plug was pulled after that because of the yeah, concerns? I think they made a second and a third episode, although they weren't completed, but then the plug was pulled and, oh, and that was the end of it. How disheartening. Yeah. Gosh. It had quite a cool logo. Right. Other, okay. than, other than One that, saving grace. Um, but they all had silly names. James G was the, the leader. Mm. See, James named after... Richard, Richard James, Trilby. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> and they had a couple of... Uh, uh, kind of agents called 1G and 2G. Right. Um, and uh, aliens called um, uh, Argent and, and Or. Oh, nice. You know, silver and gold yes. in French. Because yeah. we're yeah. international here on the of podcast. Of course, of course. Um, and that's about all I can tell you, really. Oh, they had a computer who ran everything called George Washington. Right. Yeah. I mean, it fe already, as I'm describing it, it feels like a thousand different elements yes. pulled together yeah. in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. And animated cheaply in the wrong place. Yeah, and we can't see way. this anywhere. Well, I can show you. I'll show it to you later on, Richard, <laughs> uh, and you'll never forgive me. Oh, anyway, great. that's enough about GFI. Yes, fair enough. Um, and not to be confused with Gemini Force One. No, which is a different uh, thing entirely. Yeah, if absolutely. you don't know what that is, then where have you been for the last five years? Yeah, that's right. Great. Uh, anyway, Richard, that's it. Enough. Thank you, Ralph, for your question. I hope that kind of answers it a bit, but I'm not sure I can go into any further detail, but I will talk to Chris about maybe doing a little teaser article about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but until next time, that is the end of listener emails. Lovely. And if you want to get in touch, then do email us at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. We love your audio files as well. We haven't had one of those for a Well, apart from uh, the Josh Long's wonderful fab facts last week, and of course. And Jason's one from the Couch Pilots just now. Oh, yeah. So we have had one. Yes. Yeah, so I'm yeah. talking nonsense as usual. <laughs> but we'd love uh, more. Yeah, we would. We really would. Uh, <laughs> you've also been getting in touch with us on Twitter. Now, as you mentioned earlier, Jamie, Gary Newman uh, celebrated a birthday this week, and he's a, a previous interviewee of ours. He is. Uh, Gary Newman official posted a happy birthday to me picture featuring uh, him in full Captain Scarlet mode, which is rather yes, nice, isn't as, it? as put together by Chris Thompson. That's right, yeah. Uh, Megan got in touch to say she's looking forward to the Thunderbirds Funko Pop Toys. Oh, yes, me too. She has 80 in her collection and can't 80? wait for it. Yeah, eight zero. I know, imagine that. I've got one. He's, look, <laughs> look, there's mine. Uh, there he is. Yeah, it's Tom Baker. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Jane Mill also got in touch to say, love this podcast, catching up Pod 16. Oh. Got a fair way to go there, I think. Yeah, well, she's not going to hear this for ages. <laughs> and finally, Jim Wood said, I spent 20, uh, 90 minutes listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. Uh, 20 minutes? <laughs> yeah, out of the <laughs> and 90. And then I turned yeah, off. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I spent 90 minutes listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast with Chris Packham, then turned on the TV and the news cuts to the SpaceX docking with the International Space Station. Perfect. It's all around us, isn't it? It is. What more could you want? I mean, I that, that sequence has been probably recreated yeah or, uh, was created in multiple anderson shows yeah. and elon musk grew up watching them especially space 1999 yeah that's right i know well ian jacqueline again has been in touch with elon musk this week on twitter to say please can you interview for uh, the podcast that's who right. knows might happen one of the busiest men in the world but your dad i suppose would have been all over that this week wouldn't he or the um, last week the spacex docking and the permission been and watching it on rolling news absolutely. just constantly watching it over and over and over again and no doubt would have inspired an idea would have sparked something for some... Well, some sort of disaster related exactly. to it, probably, yeah. Exactly, yeah, nice. But happily, it all went to, according to plan. Peter Derman said, it's Monday, yay! Best thing about uh, the Jerry Anderson podcast, Fab Facts. Yes! He says, let Richard know. Yeah, well, I did read your tweet, Peter. Richard knows. And uh, <clears throat> we'll move on, shall we? 
<laughs> Great. Uh, so please don't forget to subscribe to us on whichever platform you're listening to us on and read and review and share with your friends and all that sort of stuff. Mm. And do get in touch. Mm. Yeah. Please. Lovely. Great. Right then. It's uh, time for the next bit, Richard. Fantastic. So who have you been talking to this week, Jamie? <laughs> well, as I mentioned in the introduction, Dirk Maggs. Yes. Director, producer, writer... Sound bloke. Now, what will we know him from then? What sort of stuff has he written? A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is, is Dirk's big thing. He did the original radio show and has done Great. things since then. <laughs> um, but he's done a lot of stuff for Audible recently. He's mm. done the X Files for Audible, um, the Alien stuff recently too. Nice. Um, he's working on all sorts of fairly top secret bits and pieces. <sighs> well, I bet you know, uh, don't you? He's doing a live audience with the goodies. Oh, really? Shortly, which may have already gone out by the time this happens. Lovely. Uh, so, yeah, lovely bloke. Um, also knew and worked with Dad on and off. And I've got, in fact, Richard in a filing cabinet, oh, yes. which is just two and a half metres in front of you. No, not in there. That one in the... There. Right, that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah? It's, yeah. it's locked, though, so you can't oh, get yeah, in. Yeah, I can't... You've got the key. Yeah. No, oh. Anyway, in that filing cabinet yeah. are quite a few... Um, projects that Dad and Dirk were working on together oh. that never came to fruition. But you never know, they might do one day. Yes, hence so, it's under lock and key. Exactly. So they're yeah. quite exciting. Yeah. Um, but we don't get into that in this first part of the interview. This first part is all about the shows that uh, Dirk grew up loving, why he loved them, and um, particularly focusing on the sound, which is quite appropriate for a podcast. Yes. So yes. shall we hand over to Dirk Maggs? Let's do that. Well, hello, I'm Dirk Maggs. I'm a recovering Anderson fanatic. <laughs> uh, I've been trying to recover for 50 years and I still can't snap myself out of it. Whenever I hear those theme tunes, I jump to attention and imagine I'm in the cockpit of Supercar or Fireball or Stingray or Thunderbirds. Around about, uh, to be fair, I have to, uh, honest, full disclosure, I kind of stopped watching Roundabout Captain Scarlet only because um, I was getting into um, sort of other activities at that time that come with being a teenager, <laughs> shall we say. <laughs> I think is that the, a... the less said, the better, actually, there, Dirk, I, I guess. <laughs> well, it's um, not as bad as that. Well, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's leave it unspoken. OK, uh, shut my face. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lovely intro uh, and something that we all do, I think. Well, that's certainly anybody who lives in the sort of nostalgic worlds of Anderson. So mm. uh, being nostalgic or super nostalgic for a second, can you whiz us back in time and take me to your very first uh, Jerry Anderson experience that you can remember? Yeah, I can absolutely go back to my very first Jerry Anderson experience, which was Supercar. I, I do vaguely remember Four Feather Falls, but we lived in... I was actually born in Jersey, in the Channel Islands, and we didn't move to the mainland till 1961, at which time I think Four Feather Falls was occasionally rerun, because mm. I think you, they, your dad shot it on 16 <clears throat> mil, didn't he? I think uh, it, was, it wasn't It was like VT, so they could rerun stuff more easily if it was on 16 mil. Yeah, it was all film. So, um, it was probably 16, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, yeah. Um, anyway, so Four Feather Falls kind of passed me by, but Supercar absolutely got me. <laughs> I was, that's it. And it always has been since. And, you know, um, I still love it. I love everything about Supercar. I love the vehicle. I love the design of the vehicle. I know that was Reg uh, rather than... Um, uh, than um, oh, Derek. Derek, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so on, but it just got me, and I loved uh, Professor Pupkiss uh, and uh, Beaker, uh, <laughs> most uh, most satisfactory, um, you know. And I was Jimmy, you know, I was Jimmy with Mitch. That was who I identified with. You, you mean you course, were a large-headed, slightly ugly ginger boy <laughs> with freckles? Pretty actually, yeah. that pretty much describes me now. <laughs> Um, and I just loved it. And Mike was my hero. And when I was about, well, I would have been six in 61. But, you know, it was, it was I think second series was running. But uh, it just got me. And it was great. And um, I had a Mike Mercury jacket was bought for me. Oh, nice. Uh, and um, with those little sort of crenellated lapel, that sort of, you know, yokes on the shoulders. Yep. This is how de much detail I go into here, folks. That's great. And Oh, no, it's wonderful. Um, and um, and I remember I had three and sixpence pocket money a week, sixpence a day, that basically boiled down to sixpence a day uh, for a Mars bar or a comic or uh, a Milky Way or a comic because Mars bars were sixpence, but Milky Ways were threepence. And if comics were threepence, you could do both. And um, so that bought <laughs> a three and six in a week. And 
uh, at our local toy shop in about 1962. Yeah, before Fireball happened. Um, I have a very granular memory about these things. They had one of those Plaston supercars in the window. Yeah. And they were the really nice sort of inflated plastic ones, you know, that weren't solid. They didn't have wheels on. I had a real thing about I do not want a friction drive in this thing. Uh, why was that? And they that? didn't. Because it spoiled the line. It didn't. Because <laughs> if you hold it up, you know, and fly it around the room, it's got these stupid wheels underneath. That's true. That's true. Was that the budgie one that had a, the wheels yeah, on it? Yeah, it was. The, yeah, because... Oh, oh, or was it the... Um, there was one with really weird, huge front headlights on it to accommodate the wheels that they built in underneath. Oh. That was a complete no-no. It had to be as close. I was a nerd at at eight I'm, or at six or whenever it was seven. I totally it had to be right. The Plaston one was just supercar. It was pretty damn good. The dimensions were okay. The only problem was that Mike sat on a peg um, in the thing, and eventually his bottom. <laughs> His bottom wore out. <laughs> he fell off the bank. <clears throat> so you had to help him. This is really weird, actually. I hadn't even thought about this before, but in order to make Mike sit on his peg, you had to stick a bit of toilet paper up his bottom. <laughs> so- <laughs> I was not expecting this chat to go uh, Where did into this, this area so go? quickly, Dirk, but I'm thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, no, but, quite, it's quite um, all right. No, Supercar was so... It was just... I, I mean, I look back on it now... And I think there are, you know, it's all male, you know, sort of cast. And occasionally, you know, this poor old female puppet would come out of somebody's grandmother or something. Yeah. The, the, all the, it was such a weird setup. But as a kid, you don't question that. It didn't matter because there were these, they, it was a sort of family. It was a sort of early kind of um, monosexual family uh, who, who had this amazing runabout. Yeah. Um, and, and supercar, the design, I still utterly love. For me, it's as classic as a Ford Thunderbird or, a, yeah. you know, whatever. It's just got a great look to it. it so, um, you know, I, I would have one. if they. I would have a supercar. In fact, if I had had the money, I'd have, you know... Um, I'd have asked someone to build one for me, uh, you know, uh, because it just, it, it says to me happiness. Because for me at seven years old, supercar on the television, I'm happy. I used to sit through, what was it? Oh, no, I think that's Fireball. No, okay, I'll come to that. Ooh, but yeah. Get ahead of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny. Um, do you know what I'm going to do? Change chairs. Excuse me. Could talk amongst yourselves. I'll tell you what it is. I've got a very comfy chair, but it rattles a bit. So I'm now going to pull up a drum stool because I'm in my office, which has Lovely. got a drum kit in it. We're going to keep this all sit. in, by the way. Yeah, no, that's good. That's okay. That's okay. Just slightly. <laughs> the peg in my bottom's less worn out. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know where that came from. That's all right. That's um, great. I, I've never heard anybody mention um, Mike Mercury's bottom before so uh. i did, i have to say i'm sorry i brought it up but it is germane you know given we are so supercar i could talk about supercar for hours just everything about it everything but i won't so do you, but, do you not reflect on it now Dirk, and think it's it's a little bit on the sort of uh, juvenile feel, it feels insulting but a bit a little bit on the on the young side or is, is it just such a yeah. su- was it so great for you at the time you can't see it through ad- an adult lens oh that's a very good yeah you you, you put that exactly correct I, I i don't see it through adult adult eyes i'd sit down and i'm even if i'm drinking a g and t i mean i can't say i watch it a lot but you know <laughs> occasionally i've got the complete set you know yeah. and uh, and I, I watch it and i just think i think it's the ambition of it really i it, think now it was a, a real change of gear from four for the falls wasn't it it really wasn't it was such a clever idea to put the puppets in a vehicle mm. and what the and the thing about supercar was it was still puppet sized you could actually put them in the vehicle you know that fo- photo of your dad and uh, uh reg and sylvia whoever with on the studio floor with the model with the my yeah. mercury puppet sitting in it that got me that's something about the fact that this make-believe world still you could still actually put because thunderbirds which i adored you know, you could never have a full-size Thunderbird one or two, or maybe four. You could do, you yeah. know, put a, an Allen in, uh, of Gordon in rather. But um, no, supercar. It was something just so great, and you could put them all in. The, you, you know, sometimes in some episodes, they're all sort of <laughs> puppets all stuffed in. Very cozy. Know, 
It's just, it's so sweet. It's you know, there's there's Mike and Beaker in the front, and there's Pop Kiss and Jimmy and the monkey in the back, and it's just so cute. I, I don't know. It just I love it. I, I love can it. tell it holds a very special place in your heart. It really does, and it's 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 sheer joy, the joy of a child in a place. And Mike had such a great voice. Graydon Gould had such a lovely delivery. That's true. Um, it's because I'm hearing the voices, and also. An early mention for the sound effects, because mm -hmm. the one sound effect on Supercar, it wasn't so much the Foley, it wasn't so much like the individual sound effects of the creatures, but it was the sound of Supercar passing overhead. And I, I'm still trying to find <laughs> that noise. I cannot find what that somebody hopefully listening to this will say, oh, no, Dirk, you want to look at the old Decker sound effects series from 1952, where, you know, or something <laughs> like that. And I, I'm sorry, and whoever, and I, I actually characterise somebody with a strange voice like that. I don't, I, I, they my may voice well sound strange just like that. They may, I don't mind if they do, if they can tell me where it came from. There because it was that wonderful, and I think it's sort of a shell passing overhead, or something like that, that sort of, sort of noise that it makes. It's a great whoosh, isn't it? It's very oh. powerful. Kind of piercing it's a whoosh on whoosh. steroids. Yeah, and, and the sound design generally, you know, starting there, I was hearing the noises, and that was the noise in my head when I played with my plaston supercar running around the living room. I'm, my parents are saying, "Shut up! We're trying to watch the news." Um, <laughs> Kennedy's been shot. <laughs> yes, there's a missile crisis. You know, just who get that child out of here? <laughs> With that bloody plaston thing. But he just wouldn't stop playing. He wouldn't stop playing. So, uh, yes, anyway, but enough of my private life. Um, <laughs> so, anyway. You're, but, uh, you're unusual in a way, Dirk, not just for the uh, the private life stuff, but because you're you're the only person I've spoken to who has, who has mentioned the sound. And obviously, professionally, with what you do, that is kind of understandable. Hmm. But is that because the sound was making such an impression on you because i guess everybody mm. talks about the, the technical improvements and the way they were shooting it and the you know the super marination elements of the puppets and all that sort of stuff but the the care that was taken and the sounds that were designed for it and used in it the way it was mixed was really different to anything that had come before or any contemporary shows i'm guessing I don't think there was another show on television that looked after sound the way that they did. And I mm. think it's probably because the whole world they were creating, there was no way of using set floor recording. Yeah. It had to be created in sound. So there was that much more attention paid. Mm. And just silly things, you know, um, when you listen to uh, the sound effects, you know, if, if, if you move on to Fireball and Supercar, there are so many things. I, I still remember the sound of the, the, the roof doors opening in the Black Rock um, lab, you know, yeah. and, the, and the little wiggly thing that uh, Beaker sits at. And, and that whole sequence of firing the engines up, one side and then the other, fire one, fire two, you know, 12,000, 30,000, whatever it is. Yeah. You know, all of that builds up to this. It's a kind of, I mean, this is awful. Jamie, I don't know how you've got me talking like this, but it's kind of foreplay, really, because it no, builds you up right, to this right. climax. And that your dad was very good at that, yeah. very good at identifying where the sort of tingle factor was. And the sound effects had a lot to do with it, because when they got to the end of the count up on each engine on Supercar, Mike flips a toggle and whoosh, out the rockets come at the back. And out comes this very satisfying, loud whoosh at the same time and if I dare uh, and forgive me mention um, uh, Roberta Lee's space uh, what's it um, Space Patrol uh, Space Patrol yeah sound effects on that were just so thin by comparison stop the podcast uh, listeners apologies you may notice for the next nine minutes of Dirk's interview that I am rather quiet and that's because I had a software failure but didn't notice um, thankfully uh, Dirk had lots to talk about and uh, just kept talking. So hopefully it will make sense for you, but that explains why you won't hear from me for the next nine minutes or so. It was just, it wasn't, you know, it was a sort of paucity of imagination where your dad's productions were like, wham, you know. If he was going to, you know, if they were going to nail something, they bloody nailed it and it was wonderful. So, so for example, moving on to Fireball, you know, there was a, always in the opening sequence, Fireball taking off along the rail and then shooting off the end into space and the, you know, and the, and the roller skates flying out forwards. Um, but that sequence had this sort of edited rocket engine in. And I used to, you know, in turn play with my plastic Fireball or whatever it was, and I would imitate the sound effect. Um, 
including the bad sound edits that they did. <laughs> so he goes, you know, this is sort of ledged up as you, as the edit goes past the, the tape head sort of thing, which is, you, you know, if you're on a budget, you just, you know, damn it, we better bang out this effect and, you know, the boss needs to, yeah, he needs the mix, you know. So, uh, and in a way, it works, you know. And then you just accept it, you know. You're a, you're a kid. You're watching Hell's Teeth. This thing looks great, and all these, and the back end of Fireball is one of the sexiest things you'll ever see on a machine. It's just sheer brute power. There is nothing attractive about it. It's just a whole load of nozzles that are going to spew flame at you. It's nothing, you know. You could. It's like holding up a whole load of drinks tumblers on end and thinking, strap it on the end of a spaceship. It's just amazing. I don't know. It was, it was this wonderful confluence of design and, uh, and of, sound, uh, of sound effects and, and the look of the ships. You know, and that's, I, I, I was talking, Derek I met uh, 25 years ago when I was doing Loose Ends with Ned Sherin when our first attempt at doing Hitchhiker's uh, Guide to the Galaxy with Douglas Adams died, they didn't know what to do with me in Light End because they'd set aside six months for me to do it in. And so, and then in Guardhouse, who was doing Loose Ends with Ned Sherin, said, well, look, if Dirk's free, would he, would, would he take over the show for a bit? So I did and had a great time and Ned was great and had a lot of fun. But, you know, I could also push a few agendas of my own. And Derek had just released 21st Century Dreams or something like that, his, his book or somebody's book about him. And uh, so it was a very good excuse. I felt to go down to the Magic Camera Company and meet him. Seemed to be like a good excuse, and I managed to push it. Exactly. And I took my son, Tom, who at that time was about eight years old, because Tom had a beautifully clear speaking voice. Still has now, because he's a voice actor, but at that time, and he loved the shows too. So I got him to ask the questions. I thought that was a cunning ruse. Um, and Derek was absolutely lovely. It was about a year before he died, but he was, you know, totally... Uh, you know, uh, any information happily given. And, of course, walking into his trailer at uh, Shepparton, of course, he's got all these, the original artwork, his, his designs for all the ships on the walls. And um, and so we had a lovely time. And, and, you know, Derek was saying on Supercar, you know, that was very much Reggie's design, but we're on, on the Fireball, he was sort of pushing Reggie's, you know, pencil aside to, you know, hand pencil-wielding hand aside, excuse me. Sorry, too many gins. Um, to and and sort of adding stuff for his own, and you know, because of course I was getting the annuals as well. So I was like the in one of the supercar annuals. They had this thing called Super R, and even at that young age, I could see that was once I'd seen Fireball, that was a sort of prototype for Fireball, and you know it could have been a supercar spinoff, but in the end it wasn't. You know, but there was sort of I could see your dad flying kites as it were you know trying stuff out sort of how would this look you know let's design it it kind of let's do a proof of concept on it and then tweak it and then obviously they tweak it so um you know so so fireball comes along and you've got this amazing looking craft which has got that sort of brutalist look to it uh derek's fulfilling all his you know dreams of of, of childhood science fiction um and then of course you've got another the great cast and um with the paul um Oh, Paul, Paul Maxwell as Steve. And um, and I worked with Paul uh, in the late 80s. And just the loveliest man. He played the villain in the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. He was the guy with the white hat at the beginning, the older version of. And he was just a super guy. And, um, of course, you know, I was like, oh, you did, you know, Fireball and all of that. Just, um, but the, the voice casting was always very good. I've got to give Sylvia her due. You know, she did a good job there. And, um, you know, there was Paul and there was her doing Venus with the, <laughs> the fixed grin. It's like, <laughs> yeah, after a while, come on, Venus, calm down, love. Um, and, um, and Matthew Matic, which, of course, was David Graham, who'd already done um, a Beaker, Doing doing his Walter Brennan impression. Oh, Steve, yeah, fire about the new atomic reactor's gonna you yeah, gonna blow, yeah, and uh, and of course your old man's doing Robert the Robot, which is through an early version of the Peter Frampton um, 
sort of guitar thing, whatever it is. I forgot what they call it. Uh, well, yeah. At, 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 what was I? Eight. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. I used to put it this way. It must have been good because I sat through, uh, bless him, Edmundo Ross's um, whatever mu- Sunday afternoon music program in order to watch Fireball, which was pretty hard going. Although actually, funny enough, in later life, my 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 parents in law lived near Edmundo and became great friends with him. So I was always very careful to say how much I enjoyed the band uh, in the early sixties. But in point of fact, I was <clears throat> please hurry up! I want to watch Fireball this week or whatever. Now, fire, what I liked about one, of, you know, here's an. Here's another aspect. You see, this is the thing, really, Jamie. We could do about three podcasts. We're not going to, but, uh, you know, because for the sake of everyone's sanity. Because it's a world, it's worlds full of stuff. And because one of the other things that was so great about the series was they had a sense of humour. Sometimes it was a bit heavy-handed and sometimes the gags were a bit obvious. And it was quite evident that Zuni the Lazoon was Fireball's version of Mitch the Monkey because Mitch kind of worked um uh but you know and that didn't work quite so well but there was a sense of humor and fun about it and there was a bit of slapstick going on you and occasionally commander zero comes up from behind the control panel after an explosion with his face sort of smeared with soot and it's this wonderful innocent sort of playing with gags kind of thing um and uh, you know fireball i was really in my element and then um, I have to say, for me, you know, it was an exponential. It was a sort of, you know, it did build from series to series because then came Stingray, and that was a whole ledge up. Now, and it's I'm not even talking about it being in colour because we weren't watching in colour. It said Vidi colour at the beginning. Well, it was still in murky four four two five uh, yeah four oh five line black and white, um, but. Uh, the whole the 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 uh it's it was the puppets now had the frowning faces and the smiley faces you know didn't always quite come off but at the same time it was real ambition happening now to sort of give them a life and there was the atlanta troy marina triangle which even though at that age love stories are boring you know you sort of got that marina was you know kind of cool and sexy and Lanta was the fiery redhead and they were both pretty cute and Roy who was evidently James Garner and all the better for it you know I love that he was James Garner because it it gave it a certain style um I don't know whether that's you know how that arose but I'm glad they did it yeah you know it was a good character and they they the char- it got more sophisticated. The scripts, the scripting, and the characterization was just that little bit more sophisticated. You know, Commander Shaw was in that wheelchair. That was an interesting, you know, uh, development. And yeah. you sort of think, how did he get it? I mean, I think there's a back st- for the first time on Stingray. You've got a backstory. Yeah. You you want to know how did he get in that wheelchair? Uh, Marina comes in in the early episode, so you know they find her. But it's it's all of that kind of. Uh, that that, mi- that the, the mixture becomes that much richer because you're suddenly thinking, oh, this has been here for a for a while. I like this. So, you know, I kind of really got and Marineville, the whole place going underground. What a great <laughs> idea! I mean, there are so many good ideas just banged in there. The whole thing just ledges up, and the super um, what's the name Stingray rather. It, it, it's not quite as sexy for me as Super Car. Is it not? Or, no, funnily enough, although I love it, don't get me wrong. It's a if great that was design. all there was. Oh, it's great. I'm looking at one now. I have my, you know, have the you one they did about 10 years the ago. The Product Enterprise one. one. Yeah. Oh, man, they, they did a good job with <laughs> yes, that. That was fantastic. With, you know, no offence intended, Dirk, at all, uh, but there, uh, there are so many men of a certain age that I know who have that very stingray on their shelf in their office or in their home. <laughs> I don't know what you mean, Jamie. <laughs> I mean, uh, you I'm know, sorry, you I mean, you have the wrong number. I mean, young men, <laughs> <laughs> men in their twenties and thirties. Uh, well, I, I've got, I've got one here. Uh, yeah, but I also, yeah. I also have a, a twenty-inch long uh, stingray with uh, a moving, 
uh, what a rate yeah. master at the back end. Hello. So. Yeah, hello. I haven't. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, Dirk. Yes. Sorry. I didn't mean to uh, cause any jealousy there or anything. Yes. Uh, <laughs> size, size isn't everything, my wife assures me. <laughs> uh, well, you, wait, wait until you see this. It's, it's, a, it's a real <laughs> beauty. Uh, <laughs> I think we should move on. We should. Now, <laughs> you mentioned sound design. I'm going to insert a clip here uh, Ooh, a clip. of John and Jean Taylor producing some amazing sounds for Stingray. Um, mm. And I will, I will let people know how some of them uh, worked as it, as it goes along, but we'll put that in now. So just very briefly, this is rather wonderful of uh, John and Jean working in the sound studio. And they work with everything from... Um, rolls of acetate film, which is what uh, John's about to do here to create right, an ice, ice sound, a sound of stingray ice forming on Stingray, on. through to cupboards and bits of uh, machinery. So here's John preparing to make the sound of ice forming on Stingray's hull Gene, you all with an ice of acetate. This? Yes, John, OFX 640. 640. Right, how's this for level? Wait a minute. Yes, can you close in a little and take it a little slower? Yes. OK, try this. And close this. And now, All right. with uh, right. John surrounded right. by some very 60s-looking equipment, I'm not even sure what these things are. They might be in the studio right, itself. Yeah. Okay, we'll go ahead. Making stingray, stingray sounds with some very cool uh, electronics. Stand by. Perfect. 502 stingray injector tubes. Swiftly followed by the clamps, which is just a filing cabinet door being opened and closed. Fine and clamps, please. Right, here we go, and clamps. Happy? Yes, that's fine, John. Isn't that great? Mm. The, the, such simple techniques, uh, you know, and and yeah, Derek's wonderful special effects and yep. the model makers. Everybody's skills come together, and there you get that magic, and yep. that's what drags you in. Well, they all complement each other, and it feels like, especially by Stingray, I think that every department is they're all aiming above and beyond what they've ever done before. There's no there's no element, yes. even like the editing. Uh, especially the, the launch sequence, all that sort of stuff, and the titles, it all has got gone up to another level. It really does. And, and so, you know, and that clamp sound of the chairs hitting the cockpit uh, in Stingray, where the clamp sort of swings down, that's, that absolutely, you know, I, it was something that I saw at the time. I thought, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. Because it's always... What gets nerds like us is the fine detail. Yeah. It's, that's what really gets you. It's when they've thought it through down to how come those chairs don't slide around a bit when they're actually <laughs> manoeuvring through the water, you know. Uh, yeah, because it's be pretty boring an episode of Stingray where Roy and phones are basically continually adjusting their chairs. You know, <laughs> I, just, I, I can't move. I say, Troy. Oh, hello. Oh, that's the police. Oh, oh. <laughs> You've no, got, that's the son number two. I'm hopefully my wife will get that. You've got 85 different phone rings in there. Yes, I do. Yes, this is my hotline. I, you've actually yes, my war room. I've got giant screens everywhere. <laughs> With, oh, Lily, please, she's got it. Thank goodness. Right, sorry, not at all. Uh, uh, so all, all, all the all the lovely fine details, like the things, and you said about the chairs sliding around and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can imagine, you know, it would be a bit weird. Yeah, try, try. I, I can't seem to get close to Stingray. My, yeah, whatever. I can't do his voice, but wasn't he great, <laughs> was, Robert Thingamy? That was pretty close, I, I think. That was pretty good. And wasn't it great when he was? Uh, he turned up in what was it? Working Girl. I don't oh, know if I you've seen know. the movie Working Girl. Okay, great film, late eighties. Uh, and it's uh, Melanie Griffith and Harrison Ford and so on. And at the very end, there's this big, big businessman everybody's going to meet. And it's phones. Oh, amazing. It's phones with with long hair, sort of long, you know, uh, down the back, sort of long hair, and, uh, and a long granddad beard, all ginger. And, it, and I'm thinking, that voice, that, my God, it's phones. It's so sweet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but again, like the, the most memorable voices, there's so many shows... That I, I remember watching as a kid, and I can't necessarily remember it. Uh, my, my my mind's ear can't recall the voices, but pretty much every character in every Anderson show, the voices were so yes. strong and so distinctive 
that oh that's a very good point Jamie yes they just the live characters, there they do they ba- they were bang on yeah you know and um, and yeah because you know Troy was very I, I can't remember the, the actor played Troy but but you know totally good he was good I, for a long time I thought um, uh, from Mercury through Zodiac to Troy Tempest it was the same actor I think it was just that leading man voice you know yeah, great with the gravitas it. Paul had it yeah, yeah it was funny that it was kind of like that authority that you get I've worked with a, a, on one of the alien things we've done the first one um, Corey Johnson I worked with and Corey's got it you know I, I was saying to Laurel who was doing Sigourney's part um, oh I need you know I, I mean I, I'm a bit of a pickle I need an actor who can really sound like he's in control he said get Corey get Corey and Corey came in and it was like you go there you go there you do that you do that and it's like yeah I, I totally accept that this guy knows what he's doing <laughs> and he's, you know and you can't take offence because he's quite clearly in charge um, and that's that's what they had so no, but Stingray, I really enjoyed, and there were some, you know, wonderfully funny ones. Uh, Johnny Swunara, played by Steve Zodiac in a blonde wig, coming <laughs> to Marineville. Yes, and Atlanta, and all, all, Atlanta and Marina are both kind of, you know, as it were, putting on extra specially bright lipstick for this occasion. And and Troy's, <laughs> it's the frowning face all through because Troy's really cheesed off. That there's a rival in town. Roy likes uh, Troy likes to be the uh, you know the head on Joe, you know the Mr. main love rat testosterone. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny and it's so well done. And then Steve Zodiac turns up in a blonde wig and it's like yes, that's so cool. So <laughs> now I remember it well. And then so then I was so that was when I was eight nine, and yeah. then I was ten years old, and um, beginning to take an interest in. I don't know. You know, when you, when you tend to start to read sort of more grown up books, so yeah, you get you a, more of a start sense to of pretend humor. to be grown up. Yeah, you yes, yeah, so it's kind of an interesting age. Ten, eight, nine. You there's all dinosaurs and rocket ships, and then you begin to sort of get an idea that there you're still going somewhere. But anyway, my mum said, "Oh no, uh, there's a new." Um, even my mother, who you know, was not necessarily tuned into all the things that I was into in terms of you know. Uh, the Beatles or whatever um, said oh there's a new um, Jerry Anderson show coming up next week on the television and, um, and we mustn't forget you I'm sure you'd like to see it and it was <laughs> Thunderbirds amazing and and TV Times had a colouring competition uh, to win a Thunderbird 4 you know that famous win a Thunderbird 4 colouring competition I don't know if you remember this but, well you won't remember <laughs> who, it but who doesn't remember it uh, hello I'll listeners say. yes yes. Jamie pretending to be 102 <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> he's such a spring chicken um, anyway uh, but it was a colouring but the thing is it's before any I'd seen any pictures of the craft in the show and it was Thunderbird 2 coming out of the hangar just line art that you could colour in and, and it was right. a hint that Thunderbird 2 is green and I just <laughs> and I saw the shape of this thing and I thought that is beautiful. Yeah. And it was just that three-quarter view of it coming out from the archway before it reached the, the palm trees. Just holy smoke. That is a beautiful design. And they had me at Thunderbird 2 yeah. uh, in black and white as a line drawing. <laughs> so That's quite an impact that, to have on a kid, isn't it? Just, it just really a, line, was. a bit of line art going, oh, I it love this was, already. There was, something, there was something of the golden mean whatever that you know that the yep. design thing you know where, 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 where it just hits all the right notes and Thunderbird 2 had it and it still has it um, and that was it mm. I was wow I was hooked and then the first episode which was and you know which still stands up today I think is the one of the best examples of your dad's uh, oeuvre or should I say is it singular oof of your father's <laughs> oof one of the best examples <laughs> <laughs> was is that is their first is um uh, trapped in the sky is it yes uh, yeah trapped, the in, title trapped in the sky is awesome yeah with the and, and i know you know you must people must say this to you over and over on the podcast but it just bloody works and from and this is where i have to bring in another sonic element of the shows without which they would just have not had anything. It's Barry's music. Oh yeah, Barry Gray's music. Undeniably so. That's a, a vital part, and and as as memorable a character as the actual characters, I would say. Absolutely. Mm. What a giant that little man was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because sorry, I'm, and I'm not putting down by saying that. No, no. But you 
just, I mean, he thought big. He thought big. If he just had a guitar, a drum and a saxophone in the room, he's thinking big. And on Thunderbirds, where he had a budget for, I don't know what it sounds like, about a 20-piece minimum. I mean, the th- but all the theme tunes, for crying out loud. Um, uh, when he really got his hands on a proper bunch of musicians, which would be Stingray, the opening sig of Stingray. Yeah. Those Hawaiian war drums. Yeah. That that amazing riff. The the, the I mean that Darth Vogel, the G flies under the you know all that stuff. But holy smoke, yeah. the dynamics of that band. And they're having a great you can hear the bands having a good time. I can hear the drummers just rocking it. <laughs> and I and I'm thinking, how many drummers? And I reckon they probably had three drummers, one with a full kit, and the other two just on floor toms, you know, boom, ba da 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 all that stuff. Yeah. And I'm, I'm seeing the band in my mind's eye, you know, Judd Proctor on guitar and whacking away, and it's probably, it might be, uh, you know, Tony Phillips on drums, who knows? Um, not Tony Phillips, am I thinking of? Oh, Kenny Clare. It, it sounds like Kenny Clare to me, because he's okay. really driving. This is a drummer talking, sorry, quick di- divergence, but every drummer's got their own style. And Kenny Clare, who also played, for example, on the original um, James Bond theme, yeah. that uh, bam, ba da dun dun and he's playing that all in the Battle of the Symbol, and then they go into that big da da ba da 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 and he's, he's swinging the band. You know, this is a drummer's k- kicking their asses with a the, with the, with the bass drum. That's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just a thing they do. And you hear... And this is like a, um, a Stingray theme, the drumming on that. You know, they're all having a great time. And then he whacks into, you know, the chorus. And it's so it's so bizarre because there's all these see- people singing about a flipping boat. <laughs> uh, I think Stingray. you'll find it's a submarine, Dirk. But uh, a sub- I, sorry, slightly look, cooler sorry. than a boat, I'd say. But I'm yes, sorry, still, it's, it, it, but it is the, the grandeur. It's a boat, listeners, it's a boat. It's a it's a yeah. bloody submarine, but it's the grandeur and the the ambition of every element, and the music it, it, it is. typifies it, doesn't it? So, it, and it's but it, it works. It's it, it's you know it, it would be terrible if it failed, but it doesn't. It no. bloody works. And so these people singing about a submarine. Yes, um, thank you. <laughs> in, yeah, <laughs> the check in the post. Uh, the, the, they're just totally going for it and it's just wonderful I, I listen to when I'm down you know sometimes I'll put I don't know Led Zeppelin on sometimes I'll put some Barry Gray on because the dynamics yeah. are as strong as as a as a rock band in some ways yeah, yeah. I really feel that so 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 Barry does you know and Stingray's my personal favorite of all the theme tunes but on Thunderbirds it's not so much the theme tune it's that little bit of action music where you get the preview of all the highlights from the show. Yes. And that just totally rocked because they, you know, and this is where it's kind of a gamble by your dad because he's sort of betting the farm that you won't then walk off and think, oh, that's not so great. And, you know, everything's packed with explosives and then they blow up that sort of oil refinery at the end of all this thing every week. But this thing of saying, you are not going to want to leave the room for the next 45 minutes and it's too late to have a pee. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and it those are the lyrics to that bit, if there were any. Um, that, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Um, and my goodness, it was so fantastic. And so, yeah, I mean, Thunderbirds, look, what, it, there's nothing that can be said about Thunderbirds that hasn't already been said, but um, it <laughs> but let was, me just say this: <laughs> no, but I, it was great, and I tell you what, I also loved Shane as Scott. Oh yeah, yeah. Shane as Scott, and and who was the original Virgil? David something. David Holiday. Was that him? Yeah, yeah. Those two voices, perfect casting. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent perfect casting. Yeah, and in fact. Um, they had to recast uh, uh, Virgil for yes. oh, halfway through the series or something. Just for, just, just for the last six, I think it was Je- yeah. uh, Jeremy Wilkin. Yeah, and Jeremy, God bless you, man. You did a good job, but something about that first voice no, I agree. just worked nicely. They, they just were like, it was John and Paul harmonising together. They just really worked. Yeah. And Shane just had this great sort of Scott was a great puppet because it was obviously was Shane not that I, any of us knew that at the time you know but you can see Shane's dimples and everything um, <laughs> it's kind of a tougher well, it was, version of it Shane it was supposed to be Sean Connery Dirk so no yeah was that, was, that was who it was sculpted after because it would have been sculpted before Shane was was cast so maybe Ooh, Shane just God. ended up becoming looking like Scott. oh actually you might you know what I saw Shane uh, 
when I saw you a couple of years ago at the uh, Space Centre. Yeah. And he was there with his his wife who said hello and I didn't know who she was and I sort of smiled and I wish I'd said, you know, would have said, aren't you lucky to be married to Scott? <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> I will pass that on the next time I speak please to you. No, they, they're <laughs> such lovely people, lovely people. And I love that actors do what they do. And, um, but, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Scott puppet was there. But here's the thing. The Scott puppet was going grey and Shane wasn't. <laughs> Cue spooky music. Yeah. I'm just saying. Funny. And That's it, strange. But the weird thing about the Scott puppet, it really was at the temples going grey. That puppet's real. <laughs> it must be. It goes off and does it's missions and saves, saves the earth occasionally. Oh, I wish it would. <laughs> but, Shane, but, 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 you know, it looked great, the puppet, and Shane gave it that kind of voice. This is Thunderbird one coming in over. You know, it was all kind of... Just like he did it for a living. Yeah. That's what I loved about Shane. Shane and and, uh, and uh, David, who, who did Virgil, had this thing of we're just doing a job, which is what I try and preserve the sense of in everything I do. Mm. That most of the time the stories we tell are about people who just do this for a job. And and this is what I, t- you know, when I do these alien um, audio movies that I make for Audible, and we talk about, you know, what do we, how do we, how do we play this scene and so on and so forth? And I say, uh, it's not about the monster. It's about the people trying to do their jobs, even though the monster's eating them. They've still yep. got an objective. It, it's sort of wily e. Coyote in a kind of a way, yeah. you know, because they've got an objective. No matter, no matter what, how many um, boulders fall on them or holes <laughs> appear beneath them, it's this single-minded determination to somehow survive. And... And that was the feeling you got with Thunderbirds. You believed Jeff and certainly Scott and Virgil mm. were there to do their jobs. I'm, I'm not. I'm not uh, casting nasturtiums <laughs> on um, <laughs> Alan and Gordon and John, possibly the dullest person in the universe, doing possibly the dullest vo- uh, job. Uh, poor old John. <laughs> Bless him. Poor John. He he worked so hard, pacing up and down in front of those. Super-sized plastic grills yep. and these giant tape machines in the Thunderbird Five, and in the end, <laughs> God, I hope you had a good selection of videos. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, moving hastily on. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, no, just, just the ensemble of acting, and there's David Graham. What a trooper! In there doing Gordon, Brains, and Park, and Carano, and Carano. Yeah, I mean. What a, and loads what of guest a, characters too. I mean, they yes, oh yes, he did because you know, I mean, like in the jungle crawler thingy or whatever, jungle cat. Mm, what's that thing called? Oh, sidewinder, crab logger, crab logger. Oh, sidewinder. Sorry, so yeah. many machines, so many little, time. so many beautiful machines. Uh, I mean, beautiful machines, absolutely wonderful. Yeah. So no, no, that just fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. And any time Thunderbird two, the first Thunderbird two. Because they there were new ones later on, and they just didn't quite have that line on them. Um, and they were oh, a different man. color green as well. Oh, although you wouldn't oh, have seen oh, that at the time, right. would you? Because you wouldn't have been no. getting color transmission then. Slightly different, sli- slightly different shade of gray. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> like my life. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm no, dead. just magic, mate. I just you know, I'll always be grateful. And um, and so you know, so I kind of you know, Thunderbirds was. You know, Thunderbirds finished, and then I, I, I got my first set of drums and kind of went off in that direction you a bit. Left you know. it all behind. Well, yeah, I did a bit. I watched a, a Scarlet, but I have to say, um, it was the, the 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 change of head size on the puppet. It was the more realistic dimensions. Yeah. I, I thought it was superbly well done. I watched. I remember, you know, sort of seeing bits of uh, Joe Ninety and then Secret Service, and just thinking, my God, you know, that was pretty damn close to you know a perfect kind of replica of a human being yeah you know, but then why human... why are you doing it then because yeah why not do yeah, it that I mean, was my thing you know well you know the reason was obviously because dad wanted to move towards live action but then you yes. know why why have puppets that are trying to be something else it's a it's, yes. it's it's a, it's a it's a bit of a debate that people have uh the fans have as i'm sure you've heard and are aware of that yeah there's lots of people who prefer it once it gets to scarlet and there's lots of people who think it lost something at, at scarlet um, yes, and there's no and right there, answer. There is no right answer, and and you know, also it depends on the age you are. Because if you kind of joined at Thunderbirds, then you know it might have felt clunky. Maybe Scarlet was what you wanted. So yeah. I'm not going to argue. I'm just grateful for the for the time that I had with it because it really entertained me richly. And yeah. 
and also it had a sort of moral code to it, you know, which was Absolutely. to help others. I think Thunderbirds was pro- possibly the most perfectly uh, balanced exercise in violence and good deeds, <laughs> you know? Well, they'd, they'd really hit their stride and kind of found near perfection in almost every department by Thunderbirds, I think. Yeah, they so. really had. You, you're right. Um, and so... And so my life moved into another sphere. But another sphere, which actually I'm looking at the clock now, Dirk, and thinking yeah, we're going to have to. We're going to no, no. We're going to have to pick. We're going to have to pick this up because I can. Yeah, okay. we, well, there's okay. another 45 minutes. And then I met you, dad, and it was really nice, and that was it. So ta-ra. Right, bye. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dirk, will you come back and do more of this? Because there's there's a lot more to talk about, including you know yes. meet, you meeting dad and you yes. potentially yeah. working on various pro- projects together yeah. and what you might like to see happen in the future, all that sort of stuff. We have to speak yeah, again. Yeah. Oh, no, I'd love to. I'd absolutely love to, Jamie. And it's been a joy. It's, it's, you know, going back into it is just like going into a warm bath or eating bangers and mash or something. You know, it's, it's comfort food. Talk, talking to me about Dad's work is like bangers and mash in a warm bath. Brilliant. I'm, uh... But not both at the same time, Oh, not at the Jamie. same time. OK, one after the other. No. Fair enough. <laughs> it's a strange life you lead. Uh, and on that note, I've got to go and draw a bath and put the, the sausages on. No, so. no, I, I think... I'm sorry, Jamie, I'm afraid you're wrong. I'm sorry to say, it's on this note. <laughs> Thank you. Nice, nice... Sound effects. On that uh, bombshell slash horn. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll let you go, Doug, but you, you will be back... Uh, I will hopefully be, next I'd week if we can manage it but yes uh, I love that Jamie thank, thank you. you it's been a joy what a nice chap yes it sounds lovely and more to come great uh, but he does have an annoying amount of hair uh, what do you mean by that well anyone who's got a full head of this hair this is just the is, politics of envy here isn't it it, it absolutely yeah, yeah, is yeah. but you know Dirk, Dirk uh, has got a particular <laughs> spray of hair which You're is right. very cool yeah he's a bit of a cool dude is Dirk is he now yeah yeah well, you're saying that as if I'm not a... Oh, no, 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 he is as, as well. Oh, I see. As, uh, I see. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, uh, but yes, music and sound. Yeah. It always comes back to that. Yeah. Especially the music with Barry Gray stuff. Yeah, well, we've talked That's about this it. before, how indelibly linked his music is with, with, with the Jerry Anderson shows. Yeah, but it also led, Dirk and I then, like, like you heard, to discuss the fact that every department of every show really were aiming for something epic and beyond the normal bounds of kind of kids and family TV. So yeah. the music was huge, the visuals yeah. were massive, the designs, the... You know the weight of the the craft, the uh, the characterization, the voices, all that stuff was massive and epic and yes. incredible, which is why it's all kind of lasted so long. Anyway, more from Dirk. Hopefully next week, if I can uh, get him in time. Mm-hmm. And if not, then it'll be a couple of weeks from now. But hopefully, then we'll talk about how Dad and Dirk met. Yeah. Some of the projects they were working on together, although we may not be able to go into specifics for various reasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll get some interesting stuff out of the next time. Yeah, that's great. Now, it's interesting you talk about the scale of the productions. Watching Space 1999 on Forces TV over the last couple of weeks, they are, each one of those episodes it is rather like watching a mini movie, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of the production. Oh, well, they, they were all meant to be that, I think. Yeah. You know, Dad, Dad and the team honed their craft on the puppet shows, trying to make them filmmaking, so they weren't yeah. had the opportunity to work with, with live, action, live actors yeah. in a live action series, and they were, you know, yeah. all those skills. Were, were even more effective. Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, it is the best looking of the live action series, I think, Space 1999. See, I've heard yeah. people say they think, they think UFO is better mm. because Space 1999 is a bit bleak. No, I see, I like that. It appeals to me for some reason. Don't Fair know. enough. My bleak outlook on life, as must you know. Must be that. Yeah, must be that. Yeah, just chimes with me. <laughs> Richard, have you got any more. Uh... Tweet, tweet, tweets, or anything that might Any more lift tweet, your tweet, mood? tweets? Uh, no, I think we've just about covered everything. So, uh, well, in yeah, that case, yeah, do get in touch with us on on Twitter. You know how to do it. You know the hashtag by now, and you know our tags by now. So get in touch, and I'll read them out next time. Perfect. Mm. Uh, so then, it's your favourite bit now, Richard. Oh, at last! So we've got through fab facts and listener emails. We've done all the news. Yeah. And we've done the interview. Done the tweets. So it could only mean it's time for Chris Dale's randomizer. <laughs> Okay, watch my lips, Mr. Weston. Mm-mm. I've hidden your joke book. Over my dead body. Oh, don't worry, it's perfectly safe. I do appreciate how valuable it is. Some of Terry Adlam's finest gags came out of there, in fact. Right, and I intend to make sure that they don't fall into enemy hands. Look, it's all right, it's all right. It's in a very safe place, and I'll give it back to you in a tick. But first, you need to do something for me. Try me. Or be a dear and press the button on the randomizer for me, will you? Right. 
This is incredible. Are you sure this thing saves? Well, usually. Anyway, I suppose you'll be wanting your joke book back. All right, let's have it. No problem. Tell him where you hid it, Marina. M Marina, tell it. Tell. tell oh, um, uh, Mr. Weston, it, it seems we have a slight problem here. Now let's not panic. There's probably a simple explanation. You see, to keep it extra secret, I asked Marina to hide the book and not to tell me where she hid it. And she can't speak, so. Um, I'm afraid. Take them away, Sam. Bunch of amateurs. Oh, hang on, hang on. I haven't even said what episode we're watching this week. It's another brand new series on the Randomizer today. We're joining the search for Lavender Castle with a stitch in time. Get it? <laughs> Lavender Castle. The place of legend fabled right across the universe. This is our quest to find it. Well, here we go, our very first Lavender Castle, and also another landmark in the sense this is the very first episode we've covered on The Randomizer that I have never seen before. So this is going to be an interesting one to, to get through because I don't know what's coming. Uh, yeah, Lavender Castle was, when it was first screened in, in Britain, it was shown at, I think, something like... 3.40 in the afternoons, which was when I was coming home from school on the bus, so I would maybe be home in time to catch the end credits, if that. Uh, I saw the first episode when the DVD was released. It didn't really sort of encourage me to go any further with it, but let's see how we get on today. Beautiful opening titles as well. Lovely theme tune. Ba so, so squeak lot is clearing away beer bottles. Is that beer they drink on the Paradox? My, my, Mr. Sproggle, I must say you look quite handsome. Ha! <sighs> That's better. Yeah, is that meant to be beer that that so squeak lot's carrying around on the tray? I've seen that in a in a few episodes. I've skimmed through to sort of get an idea of what the show looks like. But fourteen thirty-five precisely. Yeah, they all they all sloshed on the paradox all the time. I have no idea. This is this is the dangers of reviewing a show I've never seen before. A time machine? I didn't know we had a tea machine. Don't get too excited, Roger. We can't use it. Why not? Well, it's experimental. In the wrong hands, it could destroy the fabric of the entire universe. Give over, that little thing. And we are still pouring out drinks, so we are clearly not the right hands to, uh, to deal with a time machine. Well, you're the captain, Captain. He's, that is beer, isn't it? That is beer that Captain Thrice is drinking. When I was flying starfighters, okay. I used to practice dodging in and out of asteroids, playing cat and mouse. It's surprising how well you can hide behind one of those things. What is it, Roger? I thought I saw something. Oh, there it is. It's uh, Dr. Egon's ship, the... Um... I don't know what it's called. I don't know what it's called. I'm sorry. But the Paradox is now under fire from it. Um... Oh, they've been hit. And Spoggle has got Lycus like, painting on his head. Find some cover, Roger. I'm trying, I'm trying. Now, my pet, you know what to do. I love the voice of Dr. Aegon. That's such a beautifully sinister voice. Very appropriate to the character. And all of these characters are utterly beautifully designed, I think. The CGI for the space stuff is... is okay. It's not the greatest, but... The characters and the animation, it's all beautiful stuff. It's almost like he wants us to see him. <laughs> they fell for it. They did. <laughs> it wasn't a very cunning plan, just uh, sending out... What's that parrot's name? Oh, God, that parrot's name is Trump, isn't it? <gasps> Captain Thrice has been hit. The Captain! <gasps> He's badly injured. Don't let him die, love. Oh, no. Why didn't they hit me instead? <laughs> I, I'm just a machine. Laika? Laika? It's no use. He's dead. Oh, bother. Oh. No. Got them at last. Well, one of them, but I'll get the rest. Uh, 
as soon as possible. Bear with me. Is oh god, they've covered need thrice need with a sheet. Power. Maximum power coming right up. Hit again. Ooh, is Isambard, are you alright? Oh. Is he? And Isambard's out. Only one way to get more speed now. Oh dear. This is one of those episodes, is it? Sproggle and squeak a lot. Oh no, everybody's getting bumped off. And Aegon's. Oh, Aegon's claw ship has knocked the. The engine's off the... the no, we haven't had it! How do you operate this thing? I'm not sure, and I can't raise his umbrella. Oh, never mind. Captain Thrice said we weren't to touch it. Don't you understand? The captain isn't with us anymore. <gasps> yeah, that's kind of... That's a very sad way to sort of say he's dead. Oh! And the Paradox has just been ripped in half! And gone! But, of course, we have this time machine. Thankfully, we whipped up a time machine not knowing that we were all about to die. Hmm. Very convenient, that. But we're back with uh, back at the beginning of the episode. My, my, Mr. Sproggle, I must say you look <sighs> quite handsome. That's better. Does anybody remember what happened? Uh, what's the time, Squeaky? At the third stroke, the time will be 14.35, precisely. Beep, beep, beep. I'm sure I've painted this before. What you're doing isn't bad. Routine maintenance. There's nothing routine about this. It's a time machine. Of course, the time machine. Captain, you're alive. <laughs> And still uh, drinking. <laughs> what is this guy's problem? Can someone please explain what this drink is that he's always on? All of us! Captain, don't you remember what happened? We were attacked by Dr. Aegon and you were killed! You were all killed. Don't any of you remember? The attack! Captain Thrice dying! I used the time machine! We are back in time! Um, like her, you're not well. Why don't you go upstairs? Yes, don't and get talk some about rest. the time machine that we have actually Roger, built. That's th the existence of the time machine is uh, is not crazy. The thought that we may have used it. That's insane. Asteroid. Yes. You distract their attention while I come up behind and grab them with my mandibles. You uh, what? My giant claws, idiot. Oh, yes. Yes. Then we can go down to the planet and smash them on the rocks. Well, between us, I'm sure we can think up a suitable ending. Now get ready. We're approaching the... Uh, Oh yeah, lovely close-up on the, on Dr. Aegon's face here. Shows the beautiful expressiveness in the face and also that, that earring in his nose. Lavender Castle. We can't change course now. We may miss an opportunity of a lifetime. But Captain! When I was flying starfighters, we used to practice dodging in and out of our- Stop it! That's what you said just before Dr. Aegon attacked us! They're coming! Oh, and there's CGI Captain Trump. Thrice! This clock stopped! Again. Oh, really? Sproggle, how many times have I told you not to turn the clock the wrong way? But, but if you want to correct it, you must only turn it forwards, not backwards. Backwards? What, what is it, Roger? I thought I saw something. Roger! Change course! Do as she says, Roger! Now! You got it! All oh, right, so when the male captain endorses it, We'll listen to the woman, but otherwise we'll um, we'll ignore her. Said it was there. It was. But it and I must stress again, this is a woman who can fly. You listen to the woman who can fly, because she can fly. We were literally snatched from the jaws of death, thanks to you, Lyca. And Isambard, if we hadn't fixed the time machine... How come you knew well, if we hadn't built one in the first place... Well, we didn't. I can only say that my biological clock is different. Oh, I had a brilliant plan. And so, um, this, uh, this time machine that Isambard built... Gonna... gonna hazard a guess that that's never gonna be used again on this show? Oh, we're gonna crash into the asteroid! <gasps> Oh dear. 
Massive, serious damage to Dr. Aegon's ship there. Colliding with the asteroid that he previously used to smash the paradox. Blast. <laughs> okay, we're ending on that note then. Well, that was um, Lavender Castle, Stitch in Time, and for what I had previously credited as being such a simple, basic kiddie show, that was a really ingenious way to tell uh, the, the time travel everybody gets killed, but it's okay, we undid it story. Um, yeah, only ten minutes long, but surprisingly more more mature than I was expecting, actually. So, yeah, kind of looking forward to more Lavender Castle turning up on the randomizer, hopefully very soon. Goodbye. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, well done, Chris. Lavender Castle. Is that the first one we've had? No, I think we had Dueling Banjo. Right. Maybe a little yeah. I'm sure we've had Lavender Castle before, mm. but yeah, a little known series. Um, did, did, did you watch Lavender Castle? Do you know? No, now, this is a series that I didn't even know was happening at the time, and it was something that I came to sort of later and thought, oh, that was really? That was yeah. then? A bit unusual, isn't it? I completely missed that. I suppose, you know, because I was of an age where I wasn't watching that sort of stuff and my kids weren't quite old enough to watch it and it just kind of slipped by. Well, it was preschool, so... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not ideal. Anyway, it, it's it's an unusual one because it's stop motion, um, fancy design by Rodney Matthews. Oh, it does look lovely. I mean... Uh, it's it has, very quirky yeah. and beautiful looking. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a funny one. I, it's always quite a nice thing to revisit. If you haven't tried it, uh, it seems that most of the episodes are on YouTube, so mm. just go and watch them there. Mm. Um, beautifully made, yeah. but sadly only in standard definition. A lot of the stuff was done in CG, so it's uh, another one that will never make it into um, yeah. into high definition, which is a bit of a shame. Yes. Uh, I think right now the current DVD is out of print, but we're, we're working on... Um, correcting that oh nice so hopefully in due course if you haven't got it on DVD and you can't find it on YouTube then we'll find a way to get it to you but do go and check it out because it's very sweet and the episodes are only 10 minutes long oh and so is that the last series to be available on DVD or is yeah everything else uh, yeah. other than the GFI pilot is, yeah, yeah. is available yeah so. great nice very yeah. good we've almost got the full set now yeah well well done Chris and uh, well tune in next week to see uh, to see what he gets up to next time yeah I don't know what it is I don't know We'll find out it's random, time. isn't it? Yeah, it is. That's the whole point. It, oh, is it? Oh, I see. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> I have noticed, Richard, that quite a few people have left reviews recently. Oh! So thank you to all of you who've done that. Yeah. I think Pod 35 in particular inspired people to watch it. So Great. Thanks, folks. But please do go and review us. It, it helps because people come to the podcast page and go, oh, yes. it's not terrible. I might <laughs> yeah. listen. Yeah. And then they find out. And then <laughs> yeah. they'll never Yeah, but at again. least they've given it a go. Exactly. And that's the most important thing. One thing you can do, of course, is post a link. Mm. Retweet it. Yep. Uh, so once you've given it a listen, just uh, copy the link from the address bar and uh, pop it on your Twitter and uh, tweet about us so other people get to hear it as well. That'd or be lovely. press the share button in yeah. the podcast app and, yeah. you know, just tell people. It Easily helps. done. Yeah. And, and then you, you too... Uh, could be somebody that brings in more gappers or whatever we decide we're going to call. Yes, gorpers. Gorpers. <laughs> That's not <laughs> right. Either, no, we it? need to find a word. Anyway, whatever, yeah. you, whatever you think we should be calling our listeners, then give us some suggestions to podcast at jerryanson.co.uk. <laughs> and until next time, yeah. Pod Forty One. Yeah. Crikey. Have a good week. Yeah. And we'll see great, you then. Have a great week. Yeah. Have a fantastic week. Just be good to yourselves. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>something uh, as it's our uh, ruby anniversary yes maybe. richard so um i just thought i'd um pop out and uh, get you this so oh there you go. that's so nice of you thank yeah. you yeah the leisure high yeah well i knew it was a favorite of yours I yeah you were, it is I you're a big fan of the argolins yeah except you just pulled it off my shelf richard so well i didn't much. actually make an effort to go and get you anything. <clears throat> still enjoy <laughs>